Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the university, the Kennedy Center, the Department of Sociology, we welcome you to this uh, special event. Um, my name is Cardell Jacobson. Um, we have a number of uh, family members of Ralph here, and so we, um, I'd like to recognize them. If you're comfortable, you're welcome to stand. Um, Ralph's parents, um, Boyd and Sharilla, um, Brown, and uh, he has three brothers, Stephen, Dennis, and Harvey, and some of their spouses are here. They, I think they have 29 spouses between the three of them. No, let's see. <laughs> Bad joke, right, Ben? <laughs> Um, we do recognize Ben Ogles as the Dean of the College who is here. Uh, Ralph has also uh, has three his children, um, Aisha and and uh, I got to read the name remember the names Jessica and is your is Nicole here? Oh Nicole, okay. <laughs> and. Um, a few others. Uh, Jerry Gillis is here from the University of Missouri. He was uh, Ralph's uh, PhD advisor. We won't ask him to comment here today about it, the quality of it. But uh, and then um, Connor Bailey from all the way from Auburn University, and uh, he's a former president of rural sociology. And uh, I don't know how many of the the University of Utah. Uh, Utah State faculty made it. Uh, Reed Geertsen, Reed, uh, Reed Cranick, uh, Eddie Berry, and uh, Courtney Macbeth, and Doug Jackson Smith. Uh, we welcome all of you. Uh, the prayer today will be given by Carol Ward. Uh, oh, Jerry Lynn. Where's Jerry Lynn? <laughs> Can I, can I excuse my behavior by saying I've only been department chair for one year? Will that suffice? Um, Carol, Carol uh, Ward is a member of the Department of Sociology. She'll give us the, uh, an invocation. Um, here at BYU, we usually give a, an LDS invocation. This one will be a little different, and Carol will introduce that. After which, uh, Jeff Ringer will introduce Ralph, not that we don't all know him. Hello. Um, I suspect that Ralph asked me to do this prayer because I grew up in the United Methodist Church. And so as I thought about what kind of prayer to do uh, today, I thought about different possibilities, but I looked for inspiration in a place that I thought would be very appropriate, and that's the United Methodist Hymnal. Um, I know many of you know Methodist hymns, the Charles and John Wesley, uh, but that hymnal also includes a number of very beautiful prayers from different time periods and different places around the world. I found one that I thought fit to a T, and it's written by Alan Payton, a South African writer, anti-apartheid activist. You may recognize his name as the author of Cry the Beloved Country. Um, I also thought that given that this week there are so many celebrations going on of N Nelson Mandela's life, that it would be kind of nice to hear from another South African voice. Uh, to me, this prayer reflects what many of us appreciate about Ralph, and that is the courage to look beyond the familiar, to see and connect with other people and other places from around the world, and to learn from them. So, this is our prayer. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without aid. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may 
this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. Thanks, Carol. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a pleasure to welcome you all to the Kennedy Center as I introduce Professor Ralph Brown today. Somehow it seems fitting, Ralph, that we are violating all sorts of university policy by doing this on a reading day. <laughs> Several times a week for over 20 years, uh, I've sat in this room either to give or listen to introductions of speakers. Frankly, most of them have been forgettable recitations of what we can uh, consider to be important in academia. Degrees earned, papers published, organizations led, et cetera. Ralph has certainly met all those criteria, and you can review them in his online Vita if you'd like, uh, but today I'd like to be a little more personal with my introduction. I've always considered one of the best parts of my job here on campus to be the opportunity to work with faculty from various disciplines and colleges, including many of Ralph's own department in sociology. In over 20 years of working with faculty here at the Kennedy Center, in the last dozen years as director of the Kennedy Center, no faculty has ever come into my office with more crazy ideas than Ralph Brown. <laughs> But importantly, in all those years, no faculty member has ever turned more crazy ideas into great ideas than Ralph Brown. Ralph's genius is his willingness to ask why not, and then not be satisfied with pat or shallow answers. Several years ago, the International Development Program here at the Kennedy Center was in real trouble. The faculty were divided on how to approach the subject, and the program was increasingly bloated and without focus. We asked Ralph to step into this difficult situation and make it work. Some, frankly, frankly, were doubtful that he could do it. To Ralph's credit, and to the good fortune of this university's students, Ralph has worked miracles. He has led and focused one of the largest interdisciplinary minors here on campus with real skill. Ralph might not consider this to be much of a compliment, but he's turned out to be an excellent bureaucrat. <laughs> I admire Ralph's passion and his energy. It has given the university opportunities in parts of the world where none existed previously. I also admire his selflessness and dedication to students. He has been willing to do difficult things so they can have great experiences. For those of us involved in international education, we always want more and better. More students having better experiences. Sometimes we find these goals in conflict with either more students having mediocre experiences or fewer students having good experiences. Ralph has managed this balance expertly, increasing the opportunities for students in the field while simultaneously improving the nature of those experiences. He's laid the groundwork that will benefit students for many, many years to come. It's a great privilege for us here at the Kennedy Center to join our colleagues in sociology in honoring Ralph today. So please join me in welcoming our friend and colleague, Ralph Brown. <laughs> Turn this one on. Like I said, keep the bar low. You won't go home disappointed. Um, <clears throat> we start the PowerPoint. So uh, this is formally called the last lecture. To borrow from a previous dean of my college, Clayne Pope, I reserve the right to have multiple last lectures. <laughs> um, so this will just be one in a series, hopefully. So when I was asked to give some like concluding remarks about something, I thought of a variety of things that I could be talking about. So here's some of the other ones I thought about. The role and importance of community as a community sociologist. Teaching versus information dumping, something that's dear to my heart. <laughs> Why we say moisture and Mormon prayers instead of <laughs> rain versus snow. <laughs> I'm almost certain it's because we'd have to say hail at some point in time. <laughs> that it looked like sleet, but it hurt like hail. The role and importance of the university versus a monoversity, which is something that I think we all have to be concerned about. International travel and exposure and its importance. Search for truth sim simply versus simply its defense. And perspectives on life and death. So I'll try to do a little bit of all of them, which is a big mistake, I know, but it won't be the last mistake I make in my life, hopefully. I plan on being around making a few more for a while. So, move. It's not working. There it goes. First off, the two-ton elephant in the room. I happen to have a picture of my wife and I on an elephant. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a disease, but I have a disease. I have a pretty nasty disease. It's called
called pancreatic cancer. Um, <clears throat> I figure I'm up here lecturing in what I've lectured in for 22 years. And um, back in April, I was at a, uh, at a dinner with President Samuelson, and he made the comment. He said, nice suit, Ralph. I had to actually put a suit and tie on. I said, well, President, I have this theory that for every hour I wear a suit and tie, I lose a year off my life. <laughs> Sometimes you hate it when your theories are wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in April, I weighed 230 pounds. As of this morning, I'm 175. and feeling pretty good about that. I was in the best shape I've been in in years this summer. I had a fantastic bicycle in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. After 10 years of having crappy bicycles in Cambodia, I finally got a good one for 40 bucks. And I was riding it around 20, 30 miles a day, having a great time on it. Um, but, you know, it wasn't in my goals for 2013 to figure out, hey, let's get pancreatic cancer. Um, but it happened. So all I can tell you this. I've loved my life. I have absolutely no regrets about looking backward. I'd really like to have some more, but uh, looking backward, no problem. The other day I had a dream, and uh, it's not one of those kind of BYU dreams. It was just a dream. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I had a dream, and I was actually at Utah State University, and I was running toward Old Main Hill, and I was in a dead sprint. And I woke up and thought, man, I was running. I haven't been able to do that for a while, so it was a good dream. Um, I feel incredibly blessed. Um, you guys, you stun me that there's so many people here. I figure that's just a testament that anybody will do anything to get out of studying for exams. But, but thank you so much for being here. Um, I've been given an expiration date, a best if enjoyed by date. It's like I like to refer to it as. Um, I always tell my wife that those things are meaningless anyway, so don't throw it out of the fridge. Right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, yeah, I would like a little bit more, and we'll see where this goes. We take it one day at a time. Um, got a little bit of interesting news Wednesday. I had another CT scan on Monday, and they told me Wednesday that the tumor hadn't shrunk any, but it hadn't grown any either. So we'll take a glass half full for today. So I want to talk about a few things that I've learned across the years, and um, I'm going to share them with you today. And so here's the title slide. If you get a picture like that, you've got to use it. Okay? <laughs> So cross the frontier by exposing yourself. Thank you, Ann Eater. <laughs> Why the search for truth is the hallmark of an academic. It's like, come on, it's an awesome picture. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to defy the Mormon odds, and I'm going to talk about 13 principles instead of seven steps. Okay? <laughs> now, for anyone who knows me, that shouldn't come as a surprise. I'm going to defy some of these odds and not use seven. A while back, when you first come to BYU as a faculty member, they put you through a new faculty seminar for a year. And uh, Darren went through it at the same time I did. And um, at that point in time, there was one of our colleagues came in, and she was not LDS, and she was a full professor. And I'd come in as an associate professor from another university, Mississippi State. So it was a little bit of an interesting thing going through this new faculty seminar, which we lovingly called um, EFY for faculty. Um, <laughs> and... Um, after the first semester, my colleague said, I'm not getting the kind of evaluations I'm used to getting, especially on that religion, spirituality stuff. And I said, well, just put everything in multiples of seven. <laughs> the seven steps of this, the seven principles of that, and they'll immediately know subliminally that it's true. <laughs> and so, so I'm not going to do seven. In honor of the auspicious day that it is, we're going to do 13. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of BS, bold sociology, <laughs> bloated sheep, baking soda, and Boy Scouts. Okay? <laughs> Item number one, the search for truth versus simply its defense. The film director, Louis Bunuel, used to say, I would give my life for a man who's looking for the truth, but I would gladly kill a man who thinks he's found the truth. This is, was quoted in a book by Salman Rushdie, who is still hiding out with Elvis somewhere after the fatwa was put on him by the Ayatollah Khomeini, in a book called Imaginary Homelands. And he follows it up with, this is what we used to call a joke before killing people for their ideas turned into an agenda. Might be a little bit extreme, but I do want to emphasize this point, that what I want to talk about today is the search for truth versus simply its defense. One of the things I think, find really interesting in Mormon culture and in Mormon doctrine is that damnation is literal. You stop. So what do you stop doing? You stop learning. You stop understanding. You stop pursuing. 
So the irony to me, the grand paradox to me, is that the moment you think you have the truth is the moment that you're damned. You stop. And I just think that's a really cool paradox. Now, everybody knows what a paradox is, right? It's two doxes. <laughs> All right. So to illustrate a paradox, there was a man by the name of Parmenides. And Parmenides once made the comment that all Cretans, and he was from Crete, and he said all Cretans are liars all of the time. <laughs> and it doesn't work. It sounds fine. It sounds good. On the surface it works. But the deeper you dig into it, if he was lying, then he was telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, then he was lying. It doesn't work. Paradoxes are what we study as sociologists. Social life is complete with paradoxes. Okay? So if, to me, one of the really interesting ones is in the Mormon tradition, the moment you think you've got the truth, that's the moment you're damned. The motto of our university is the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Also within the Mormon tradition it says, truth is knowledge of things as they are, were, and are to come. When you stop learning, when you stop pursuing, when you stop looking for more truth, that's when you're damned. Um, several years back I was on the uh, graduate council here at BYU, and the graduate dean asked us if we would all write up uh, a statement about what graduate education means at BYU. So I wrote the following that I'm going to share with you. I particularly like this author's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it says BYU provides, I'm going to sit to read this, sorry. <clears throat> BYU provides an educational environment where students who don't wish to be accosted by a variety of distractions can come and feel safe while not sacrificing the intellectual challenges to personal views of the world that should be the hallmark of higher education. One should not mistake the safety of the larger environment with the safety from having to address challenges to their dearly held ideas about the world. We are, after all, a university. And while we strongly encourage students and faculty to hold to a defense of truth in their personal lives, we also encourage the search for truth that has epitomized the academy from its origins. Graduate students at BYU, LDS and non-LDS alike, should be constantly challenged intellectually. Their views of the physical and social world should be malleable enough to accept change. The spiritual dimension comes in a recognition that such a thing is part of the human condition and is ignored in the search for truth only at the peril of the searcher. We make no apologies at BYU that the spiritual dimension to us is real and a necessary part to a universal education. The, <clears throat> the spiritual dimension should prod BYU graduate students to explore their inherent incompleteness of truth and create in them a spirit of awe and humility toward its pursuit. Too often, however, I feel our students interpret the spiritual dimension of their natures as a rubber stamp defense of truth. They come to BYU to reaffirm what they already know to be true and fail to see that education especially graduate education, is about what one doesn't know. We must be careful not to create cohorts of naive braggarts who have simply reaffirmed for themselves, yes, I already knew that. Research by Stan Albrecht published in BYU Studies in the mid-1980s showed that Mormons and Hasidic Jews <coughs> are the only major religions where increased education is accompanied by an increase in religiosity. We need our students to realize that they do not have to have all the answers already, and therefore that they need to actively engage in the search for truth as a cornerstone of their graduate education. They also need not fear the personal changes that may be required of them in their own lives, attitudes, perceptions, etc., once they discover some of these truths. Education is fundamentally about change. We need to make sure that we have confidence in our own message at BYU. One can engage in the search for truth, else why publish in professional journals, if we already have all the truth, prospects, prospects seems oxymoronic, while defending a religious truth in his or her own life, a truth that further characterizes one's zeal for discovery and should not foster an attitude of complacency. President John Tanner, who was the third president of the Mormon Church, said the following about this. In regard to our religion, I will say that it embraces every principle of truth and intelligence pertaining to us as moral, intellectual, mortal, and immortal beings. Pertaining to this world and the world that has come, we are open to truth of every kind, no matter whence it comes, where it originates, or who believes in it. Truth, when preceded by the little word all, comprises everything that has ever existed or that ever will exist and be known by and among men in time and throughout all ages and eternity. And it is the duty of, an intel of all intellectual beings who are responsible and amenable to God for their acts to search after truth and to permit, permit it to influence them and their acts and general course in life, independent of all bias or preconceived notions, however specious or plausible they may be. Pretty straightforward. Our job is to search for truth. When you think you've got it, that's when you're damned. Second point, 
Scholarship, then, is the language for the search for truth. Read, and read broadly. When I took my first graduate methods class at Utah State University, Gary Kiger was my instructor. And I remember sitting in that class and somebody was talking about a project they were working on and Gary started rattling off all these different books and articles that these students should be looking at. And I raised my hand and I said, how do you know all that stuff? And he goes, you read. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Mississippi State University and had two PhD students in my office and we were looking at a project. We were working on a project in Vance, Alabama, a town of 300 people where the Mercedes-Benz plant moved in and put in 1,500 employees. We call this social disruption. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and I was talking to them about some articles they should be looking at, some books that they should be reading. And one of them says, how do you know all this stuff? And I sat back and went, you read. <laughs> and I just remember Gary telling me that. Sometimes in the academy, we end up creating false dichotomies. All the time in the academy, we end up creating false dichotomies. One of the false dichotomies that is the most heinous, in my personal opinion, is are you a book discipline or are you an article discipline? I want to make an argument we're all book disciplines. Articles are important, but articles decontextualize from the larger stories that create the, the concepts and the larger stream of, of where these ideas come from are articles that only have very limited worth. They're necessary, but books set the big picture. To make that point, I want to read from one of my favorite books. Seeing how we're talking about reading, I figure it's apropos to read. Okay. Um, this is a book by Umberto Eco, and it's one of my favorite books in the world. It's called The Name of the Rose. They made a really bad movie out of it. Read the book. <laughs> Even though it stars Sean, stars Sean Connery. Um, this book takes place, it's a, it's a mystery novel that takes place in the 1300s in a monastery in England. And the whole premise of the book is that the, uh, the lead monk in this story, which is Brother William, is trying to solve some murders that have taken place in this monastery. And he has a novice by the name of Adso, and Adso is who's narrating the book. And they get to a certain point where there's some puzzlement about what's going on, and William has decided that science and this new emerging idea of using logic is a really important thing to do instead of just relying on superstition and other kinds of things. And so he says the following to Adso. It seems to me indeed that this page speaks of something there has been talk about during these past few days, but I cannot recall what. I must think it over. Perhaps I'll have to read other books. And Adso responds, why? To know what one book says you must read others? At times this can be so. Often books speak of other books. Often a harmless book is like a seed that will blossom into a dangerous book, or it's the other way around. It is the sweet fruit of a bitter stem. In reading Albert, couldn't I know what Thomas might have said, or reading Thomas, what Averroes may have said? True, Adso says, was the amazement. Until then, I had thought each book spoke of things, human or divine, that lie outside books. Now I realize that not infrequently, books speak of books as if they were spoke among themselves. In the light of this reflection, the library seemed all the more disturbing to me. <laughs> it was then the place of a long, centuries-old murmuring, an imperceptible dialogue between one parchment and another, a living thing, a receptacle of power not to be ruled by a human mind, a treasure of secrets emanated by many minds surviving the death of those who had produced them or had been their conveyors. Books speak of other books. There's a long, centuries-old conversation that contextualizes what you find in an article. If we don't know what the context of the article is, we have very limited information. We're all book disciplines. It's the ongoing conversation across these books. A little bit more. Back to you read. <clears throat> And this is Adso talking to William again. He's a little bit perplexed about, well, sometimes don't books lie? That's kind of the context. It's, but how can we trust ancient wisdom whose traces you're always seeking if it is handed down by lying books that have interpreted in su with such license? Books, William responds, are not made to be believed, but to be, subjected to, but to be subjected to inquiry. When we consider a book, we mustn't ask ourselves what it says, but what it means, a precept that the commentators of the holy books very clearly had in mind. 
True learning must not be content with ideas which are in fact signs, but must, but must discover things in their individual truth. Another one of my favorite books by Henry Rosofsky, who is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. And the name of the book is The University and Owner's Manual. And he talks about why people come, become professors. And then why, pe why people become predominantly teaching professors versus research professors. And he begins breaking all this down. So he says, still in thinking about what draws faculty to research, he's talking about a research professor, two factors I take to be of utmost importance. First comes love of learning. That may sound trite, sentimental and self-serving, but nonetheless it's true. Career choices are affected by the requirements of the trade. Those who opt for the military must have a certain predisposition toward uniforms, demanding physical challenges and patriotism. Politicians have to feel some attraction toward people, power, and oral communication. And academics are students who never grow up. People who wish to remain students for the rest of their lives. Is not this one way to express the love of learning? Research is an expression of faith in the possibility of progress. The drive that leads scholars to study a topic has to include the belief that new things can be discovered, that newer can be better and that greater depth of understanding is achievable. Research, especially academic research, is a form of optimism about the human condition. Persons who have faith in progress and therefore possess an intellectually optimistic disposition, teachers, scholars, so on and so forth, are probably more interesting and better professors. They are less likely to present their subjects in excessively cynical or reactionary terms. One last one. This is a book by Davos Obel called Galileo's Daughter. Galileo lived in the 1600s, early 1600s, and he had a genius for a daughter. That was a problem in the 1600s if you were a woman and you were a genius. So he put his daughter into a convent so that she would actually survive into her adulthood. Evidently, she was even brighter than Galileo in many respects. And they had a long correspondence back and forth over her life and his life and half of that correspondence has been saved in her letters in response back to her father. And that's this book, Galileo's Daughter. There's a passage I want to read here real quickly that talks about Galileo's ideas of searching for truth. And Galileo's ideas of where religion stops and logic kicks in. Despite the strength of his argument, Galileo personally wished to abandon all such astronom uh, astronomical interpretations on the grounds that the Bible spoke to a more important purpose. As he had once heard the late Vatican librarian Cesare Cardinal Baronio remark, the Bible was a book about how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. Quote, I believe that the intention of Holy Writ was to persuade men of the truths necessary for salvation such as neither science nor any other means could render credible, but only the voice of the Holy Spirit. But I do not think it necessary to believe that the same God who gave us our senses, our speech, our intellect, would have put aside the use of these to teach us instead such things as with their help we could find out for ourselves, particularly in the case of these sciences of which there is not the smallest mention in the scriptures, and above all in astronomy, of which there is little notice is taken that none of the names of the planets are even mentioned in this holy writ. Surely, if the intention of the sacred scribes had been to teach people astronomy, they would have not have passed over the subject so completely. You read. There's a long conversation across books, books dealing with Galileo's daughter, books dealing with how to run a university, and books dealing with a novel taking place in the 1300s. Third point, be an intellectual migrant question reality and cross a frontier. I was in Thailand a couple of years ago and an LDS couple sister missionary said, with all this travel you do, how do you keep perspective? I almost choked. <laughs> I said, that's how. <laughs> you pop out of the freaking bubble and you look around and you realize it's a bubble. <laughs> call it epistemic closure. The idea behind epistemic closure is if I believe it, it must be universally true. If I don't believe it, it must be universally false. We all enjoy our own epistemic closure. 
it's really comfortable. It works well for us. We like it because then we don't have to question anything that we don't want to question. I want to read out of, again, Imaginary Homelands by Salman Rushdie. A great quote, I think. So the effect of mass migrations has been the creation of radically new types of human being. People who root themselves in ideas rather than places. In memories as much as in material things. People who have been obliged to define themselves because they've been so defined by others, by their otherness. People in whose deepest selves strange fusions occur, unprecedented unions between what they were and where they find themselves. The migrant suspects reality. Having experienced several ways of being, he understands their illusory nature. To see things plainly, you have to cross a frontier. Being an intellectual migrant then is questioning reality, crossing a frontier. One last one. Sociologists by the name of Peter Berger and Anton Zegerfeld. The book's called In Praise of Doubt, How to Have Convictions Without Becoming a Fanatic. says the following. <clears throat> Excuse me. When, for example, one migrates to a foreign country, one ought to learn its language, its manners, its religious and secular ceremonies, and its ways of acting, thinking, and feeling. In short, its institutions. In that way, one approximates the meanings, values, and norms of the people in the new social habitat. Such appropriation is necessary if one is to communicate and interact with one's new neighbors. It may take a while, but eventually one will experience the benign certainty of an institutionally grounded, taken for grantedness. It's a sense of feeling at home. Although the old world one immigrated from lingers on memories and emotions. In fact, the sense of living between two different worlds is often a twilight zone of multiple doubts and uncertainties that last until one's death. Usually, though, it fades away after the second or third generation. Migration isn't a new phenomenon, but it's reached unprecedented dimensions in the modern era. Thus, the world today contains millions of people who straddle two and oftentimes more than two cultures. I'm going to argue that we all should be doing that. The slippery nature of reality, back to the epistemic closure, back to the Mormon argument of damnation. When you think you've got it, that's when you're damned. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of ideas that I've got about reality, context, and perception, and how the two affect each other. Context. So what do we mean by context? This is an interactive part where somebody can actually answer. Mike, you look like you want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, context would be the cultural and physical situation within which an action takes place. What an awesome academic explanation. <laughs> it's perfect. I know. Isn't it awesome? We all became academics. Okay? Now, so let's, let's talk about context. I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to ask you what you see. And if you've seen this, don't spoil it, okay? Um, they used to take Landsat photos. Landsat photos were horrible. You had to have a PhD to learn how to read between light and darker f um, um, figures and stuff. This was long before Google Earth where you can zoom in on somebody in their swimming pool in their backyard. <laughs> Okay, so Landsat photos were interpretive. So I'm going to show you a Landsat photo, an old Landsat photo of Utah Valley, and I'm just going to give you a hint. I want you to tell me if dark areas are water or if light areas are water, okay? What do you think? We haven't got a lot of time on this, so look at this, for example. What does that look like? Kind of like a river? All right. This is probably BYU over here in the swamp. <laughs> Anybody see anything different? Something you might see on a farm? How about a cow's head? There's the cow's right ear, forehead of the cow, cow's left ear, cow's left eye, nose, nostrils of the cow. Anybody not see the cow? I did this once in an intro to social class at Mississippi State, and one student said, it's a frog. <laughs> I said, there is no damn frog in that, in that picture. <laughs> and she insisted that it was a frog, and she would not back off that it was a frog. I can assure you it's just a really bad photo of a cow's head. Now, I set a context for you. 
the context led you astray. You were looking for water versus land. Had nothing to do with water versus land. But by me shaping a different context, I gave you a certain type of epistemic closure. And you were only looking for water or for land unless you were really just mischievous and you decided to look for something else. Okay? Here's another one. I want you to look at this next picture and look at the context. Examine what's happening in this picture. Where are the actions occurring? How do you know that? How are they dressed? What does that tell you? And what's their emotional state? First off, they're in flannel, so it has to take place in Vermont. Okay. Um, what are these? Hard hats, helmets, lunch pails, discuses. This guy's praying to the goddess of discus throwers. What is this dude doing? Looks like he's getting ready to fall. How about what's behind them? Yeah, blocking a punt. Seriously, it's a 15-yard penalty if he does that. Scaffolding. Where do you find scaffolding? Construction. construction site. So what might a context, knowing that this is a construction site, and a bunch of Vermonters in, in uh, flannel shirts, with these, how might that explain what's going on in this picture? Not a lunch line? Not looking for work? Anybody know what it is? It's a pane glass window. These are suction cups, and this guy is steady in the window. <laughs> and the picture's taken through the window. Now, my intro students get this in a matter of minutes. You guys are pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a classic one. Take a bunch of Psychology 101 students. We know more about Psychology 101 students than any other group of humanity on the face of the earth, because <laughs> they're always subjected to these interesting experiments. This is the old woman, young woman thing. They take a third of them, they show them no pictures. They take a third, show them young women. Take a third, show them older women. And the one third that has been shown no pictures either see nothing or they see one or the other. The ones that have seen pictures of younger women see the young women. The ones that have seen pictures of older women see the older women. Can you guys, you see them both? If you don't, tough. Moving on. <laughs> Context also then affects our perceptions of things. Like I said with the Landsat photo, I changed the concept and it changed your perception. Decept per perception depends on your point of view or your standing. This is both metaphorical and literal. So this is a tree in uh, Tapram Temple in Angkor Wat, Cambodia. This is one view of it. That's another view of it. And to get my nephew Chris into the picture. <laughs> That's another view of the same tree. Where you're standing metaphorically and literally will influence what you see. I want to give you a couple of cool examples. M.C. Escher. Water is defying gravity and going uphill. Lennon never made a better shot in his life. <laughs> Shouldn't push too hard. I like the Queen's new hairstyle. <laughs> Got to get my friend Kirk Jowers in there. <laughs> this one's just weird. <laughs> I don't even want to know what angle the cameraman was at to get there. And I, <laughs> and I always knew cats were spineless. How many legs? <laughs> and finally, the long arm of the law. <laughs> So even just a few inches off, in any one of these pictures, you would have gotten a very different perspective of what the picture was. Okay? In sociology, we have this thing called the Hawthorne effect. Back in the 1940s during World <laughs> War II, there was the White Westinghouse electrical Hawthorne plant outside of Chicago. And they were making dashboards for B-17 bombers. And as B-17 bombers were getting shot out of the sky, they had to find a way to increase the production of these dashboards so they could get more bombers up and flying faster. In comes this famous of all famous people, Elton Mayo, who if anybody study organizational behavior will recognize his name, or if you've had a ham sandwich lately, you would recognize his name as well. <laughs> Elton Mayo was the guru of, of organizational behavior. So he and his buddies come into the white Westinghouse Hawthorne plant, all dressed in white lab coats and clipboards. I'm embellishing the story a tad, but it'll help me make my point. <laughs> And they go into a room and they turn the lights up, production goes up, productivity goes up. They turn the lights down, productivity goes up. They put more people in a room, productivity goes up. They put fewer people in a room, productivity goes up. Seemingly, it doesn't matter what they do, productivity goes up. 
we ended up calling it the Hawthorne effect because it was based on what we call a self-fulfilling prophecy. They knew what they were after. They go, oh, this must mean we're supposed to work harder. And so because the respondents already knew what the researchers were after, they responded appropriately in what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Another famous sociologist by the name of W.I. Thomas, and I have this theory about famous sociologists, they have to have really cool names or, you know, or cool initials. They can't just have two-syllable words like Ralph Brown. It's, it's what's perceived to be real will be real in its consequences. If you perceive it, you create the context that makes it real. Okay? Um, a little story from junior high. My wife teaches junior high school, and I am convinced that anybody who teaches junior high should be sainted by multiple religions. <laughs> okay? Walking bags of hormones with no brain cells. <laughs> I think I'd just kill them. Um, knowing my own junior high experience. So we used to pick on somebody, we'll just call him Bob. So we, Bob would walk in, and first guy go, Bob, you look sick. I'm fine. No, Bob, you really look sick. Third guy, Bob. Bob, 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 you look bad. Fourth, third person, Bob, are you okay? By the time the fourth person, we always got to about four or five before this happened, Bob had puked on his shoes. <laughs> it was really cool. This was long before I knew there was a term called sociology, okay, <laughs> or self-fulfilling prophecy. And Bob goes home sick, self-fulfilling prophecy. How you perceive things will determine to a great extent how you act on things. The context will de determine to a great de degree how you do that. So let's talk about another metaphor, a metaphor of lenses. Thank you, Nicolas Cage and John Lennon and a random person with interesting glasses. <laughs> lenses change your perspective. Anytime light goes through a lens, I'm not a physicist, but I know well enough that it diffracts it, it changes it on its focal plane on the retina. You add it successive lenses, you'll get a different kind of result. Here's some of my subsequent lenses that change what I see in my perception. Um, I'm an American. I'm male and, in small letters, bald. Okay? I used to be 6'5", but this interesting thing has taken me down to 6'3". I'm still trying to figure that one out. I'm educated. I'm a Mormon, I'm a sociologist, and I'm trilingual. I can get in trouble in Cambodian, but not quite out yet, or I could argue that I'm quadlingual. These, every one of these things affects how I view the world. Now a question, how many of you speak a second language besides profanity? <laughs> Excellent. Are there concepts, ideas that can be expressed in that language that fundamentally do not exist in English? Yeah. Are they real? The, the response would be damn right. Yeah, definitely they're real. They're absolutely real. But are they real to an English speaker? No. They're just going to have to take your word for it. Okay? So, a very famous theory called the Sapir Whorf Hypothesis came out of the 1920s. Sapir went on to different things. Whorf ended up starring in Star Trek movies. <laughs> okay? Talking about language. It says, human beings do not live in the objective world alone, nor alone in the world of social activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. It is quite an illusion to imagine that one adjusts to reality essentially without the use of language, and that language is merely an incidental means of solving specific problems of communication or reflection. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built upon the language habits of the group. No two languages are ever sufficiently similar to be considered as representing the same social reality. The worlds in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. We see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because the language habits of our community predispose certain choices of interpretation. Now, a couple of summers ago, Zaid back here, we were in Amman, Jordan, and Zaid and Lauren and I were sitting in a chicken restaurant having a great time eating some Dajaj and enjoying it. And we got into this conversation that Latin-based languages are noun-based. Semitic languages are verb-based. And we came up with this argument. Let's take, for example, cathartic purge. We take something that should be a verb, and we've made it into a noun. And, and Zaid come up with this great argument that was truly an Arab argument. He goes, what about cathartid? <laughs> <laughs> and, said, and we said, no, nope, there will be no catharting here. <laughs> okay? and, and the idea that if you're a Latin-based language, you think in nouns. If you're a Semitic-based language, you think in verbs. That's really, really different. Okay, really different. 
book came out in, 19, in 2010 called Through the Language Glass, Why the World Looks Different in Other Languages. An example that came out of that is many languages use gender as a way to classify different words. They argue that German for bridge is a female gendered word. Spanish for bridge is a male gendered word. It shows that German bridges tend to be sleek, narrow, thin, and Spanish based bridges tend to be thick, bulky, and such. Um, another example of that, um, this can be a little bit weird, but what's new? Uh, <laughs> is it possible for a man to be hysterical? Not ha ha hysterical, but ah hysterical. Sure. It's possible, yes. Generally, however, do we use it for women or for men? Usually almost exclusively for women. What's a hysterectomy? <laughs> Hysta is the Greek word for uterus. And the idea was that the woman's uterus detaches itself, floats about her body, thus causing her to become hysterical. Even though you don't know the etymological roots of that word, culturally, we still see predominantly hysteria as a female thing, whether you know the etymological roots to it or not. Lenses, perspective, language, they shape what we do. They're more than just an attitude. They shape what we desire, avoid fear, and they shape what we believe. They shape the, the epistemic closures that we're willing to lock ourselves into. So the argument would be, know what lenses you wear. Allow that they shape your reality, that you do not have a corner on what's real. You have a corner on what you've interpreted as real. And then realize you're in a box, which brings me to point four. Step out of your box. <laughs> Build a new box, and then step outside of that one too. In other words, question your own dearly held beliefs. One of the worst things that can ever transpire in academia is if you don't have critical if you don't have good criticism coming back to you and you start believing your own ideas, somebody's got to take a baseball bat to them sometimes. Build lots of boxes, view things from a different cultural context, different perspectives. Learn new languages and cultural perspectives. Emmanuel Wallerstein once made an argument, said if you wanted to be a scholar, you had to be fluent in at least five scholarly languages. Whoops. <laughs> um, I'm not there. But he actually has a really good point. He said, how do you even know what's out there in the scholarly world if you don't have access to it because you have linguistically cut yourself off? Change your context, get some new lenses, change your perspective. T.E. Lawrence, a.k.a. Lawrence of Arabia. Interesting man. He was credited with creating, fomenting the Arab revolt, which in many respects brought World War I, a horrible war, to end. T.E. Lawrence dressed as an Arab, learned the Arab language, and he had the following comment in his memoir, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. He said, in my case, the effort for these years to live in the dress of Arabs and to imitate their mental foundation quitted me of my English self and let me look at the West and its conventions with new eyes. They destroyed it all for me. He could no longer look at the West the same way. He had a dream that he would be knighted by the time he was 30. When he was 29, he stood before King George V to be knighted in a private ceremony. They put down the pillow of vestiture for him to kneel on so that they could, the king could tap the sword on, different, on his two different shoulders. He, refused, he politely refused to kneel, politely refused the Medal of Honor and knighthood, turned and walked away. I'll tell you why a little bit later. Truth then, if we're looking for truth, the search for truth, it's in the diversity of perspectives, not in a perspective. One of my favorite verses from the Holy Quran, Surah 49, Ayat 13. O mankind, indeed we have created you from a male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the, right, is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. God created diversity. An example of this, I've lived in Utah and I've lived outside of Utah. Mormon wards, for those of you who are not familiar with Mormon wards, Mormonism has lay leadership. So they have to bring in a whole bunch of people. There has to be enough Mormons in a geographic region in order to create a ward, or like a parish. When I lived in Starkville, Mississippi, 
my ward boundaries were 175 mile radius. Okay? I live in Springville, Utah. My ward boundaries are four city blocks. In Starkville, Mississippi, the lumberjack was sitting next to the heart surgeon, who was sitting next to the farmer, who was sitting next to the insurance salesman. It was complete heterogeneity in terms of social economic standing. Had to be. In my four city blocks in, St in Springville, Utah, it's complete homogeneity except for the one Democrat who everybody knows who it is and prays for. <laughs> okay? That's me. <laughs> okay? All right. So, same policy, same argument, complete opposite outcome heterogeneity versus homogeneity. In other words, if you're taking this to heart, take nothing for granted, take nothing at face value. Ask about it. Things are not always as they seem, back to the Parmenides paradox. Family market, custom killing. <laughs> <laughs> Police station, toilet stolen, cops have nothing to go on. <laughs> Subtle but effective. <laughs> I think this is somewhere in, in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is the only state I've seen where the state liquor stores are off the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> also subtle but effective. <laughs> Two options to expand in your mind. <laughs> College or weed. And one of my favorites. Teach our children writing. Where was the pick? Not gambling. And my all-time favorite. <laughs> Illiterate? Write for free help. <laughs> Somewhere in Utah Valley, Satan's Kingdom, say recreation area, probably where the Democrat lives. Okay. I just thought this was fun. I, clearly, it's not from a northern state. <laughs> Toilet, stay in your car. <laughs> Cheryl, Z here and get gas. Which, by the way, I'm sure it's TMI, but that's like the weirdest thing about this whole pancreatic cancer thing. Right now, I'm producing enough methane that I could power a small Chinese city. It's, 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 it's really interesting. If I have to leave in the middle of this lecture, that means there was a call for power. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Emergency, 174 kilometers ahead. Don't give up hope. Right. And then, caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edge of the sign. Also, the bridge is out of here. All right. So, Things aren't always as they seem. You can't always take them at face value, which brings me to number five. Embrace the contradictions. There are opportunities to cross an intellectual frontier. Um, a few years back, I was on a USDA, United States Department of Agricultural Research panel. And you go to Washington, D.C., and you're there for three days, and there's 12 of you, and you have 100 proposals, and you can fund 10. And so for three days, you hammer out which of the 10 out of these 100 are going to get funded. It gets to be really interesting dynamics. You're with each other all the time. You go off to eat. And like the second night there, um, we were off going off to eat for dinner. And one of my colleagues, an agricultural economist from the University of Minnesota, said, so you're a sociologist. Uh-huh. Busted. He said, and you're a Mormon. Yeah. He goes, how do you reconcile those two things? I said, I don't. <laughs> and she goes, all the issues with, with, with gender in your church. And I said, yeah. I'm all on that too. said, so my list, as long as your list is, my list is 15 million times longer. Because I have been around a longer, you and I have even more questions. And she looked at me befuddled. And I said, look, it's just one of a million contradictions that I live every day, just like every other human being, just like you. My job as a sociologist is to study paradoxes, to study ironies. And that's all social life is, is none of us live a contradiction-free life. We just choose which contradictions are more important than others. And I said, it's just one of a million contradictions I live just like you every day. And she goes, that's a good answer. Never thought about that. And I said, let's compare lists. <laughs> one more out of the name of the rose, if you'll indulge me real fast. <clears throat> so this is William talking to Adso, his novice. You understand, Adso, I must believe that my proposition works because I learned it by experience. But to believe it, I must assume there are universal laws. Yet I cannot speak of them because they 
the very concept of universal laws and an established order, and if an established order exists, would imply that God is their prisoner, whereas God is something absolutely free, so that if he wanted, with a single act of his will, he could make the world different. Hatzel so responds, and so, if I understand you correctly, you act, and you know why you act, but you don't know why you know that you know why you know what you do. <laughs> I must say with pride that William gave me a look of admiration. Perhaps that's it. In any case, this tells you why I feel so uncertain of my truth, even if I believe in it. Back to Emmanuel Wallerstein, who quoted a while back. He gave a presidential address to the World Congress of Social Sciences back in 1998. He said the following, but if the universe is in fact intrinsically uncertain, it does not follow that the theological, the philosophical, and the scientific expertise have no merit. And it utterly, and it surely does not follow that any of them represents merely a gigantic deception. What does follow is that we would be wise to formulate our quests in the light of permanent uncertainty and look upon this uncertainty not as unfortunate and temporary blindness nor as an insurmountable obstacle to knowledge but rather as an incredible opportunity to imagine, to create, to search. Pluralism becomes at this point not an indulgence of the weak and ignorant but a cornucopia of possibilities of a better universe. Permanent uncertainty should inspire, not depress. Six, be yourself, but if yourself is a jerk, be someone else. <laughs> I think this one's important. There's a lot of ways to interact with people, and there's a lot of people who interact with other people as jerks. Not necessary. Be nice. <laughs> I often tell the students that work with me is, when I die, the worst thing that they could put on a headstone is he was a great sociologist. Oh, horrible. All I want on a headstone is he was a nice person. That's all I want. I just want to be known as a nice person. The best coaches in the world are coaches who inspire people to work for them, who inspire people to achieve higher, not put fear in them and punish them when they fail to achieve. Mike Krzyzewski, I think, is one of those wonderful coaches at Duke. He makes people love his system, and they buy into it, and they don't want to disappoint him. They work hard. Be yourself. If yourself is a jerk, try being someone else. Number seven, following along. Dare to be different, but know why you're different. Be different with a purpose. I'm not going to read all of these, but this is from one of my favorite Greek philosophers, Epictetus, who wrote a book called The Manual, 300 BC. Let's just read the last, the last two. If a man has reported to you that a certain person speaks ill of you, do not make any defense to what has been told you, but reply, the man didn't know the rest of my faults, else he would have not mentioned these only. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Pile it on. You know, of course. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? 35. When you decide that a thing ought to be done and are doing it, never avoid being seen doing it, though the many shall form an unfavorable, unfavorable opinion about it. For if it is not right to do it, avoid doing the thing. But if it is right, why are you afraid of those who shall find fault wrongly? It's okay to be different. You want to be. I mean, we need to be different. It's the diversity that brings a really cool search for truth. Which takes me to the next point. Eight, live life fearlessly. Go out in a ball of flame. <laughs> All right? The coward dies a thousand deaths, the brave man but one. Thank you, Shakespeare. Too many see and thus create a world of fear. Every time I take off to the Middle East, somebody inevitably goes, oh, be careful, those Muslims out there. It's like, oh my gosh. I feel safer on the streets of Amman than I do in Orem, Utah. Orem's a sketchy place. <laughs> <laughs> the world's a scary place. You be careful. The world's an evil place. Blah, blah, blah. You've heard all these. This is tied. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And blah means fish in Thai. So fish, fish, fish. Okay, blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, I went on a Mormon mission at 19 years of age to Indonesia. And I discovered that the world wasn't what people who had never been there told me that it was. 
nattering nabobs of negativity, to borrow from Sparrow Agnew, okay? <laughs> the, <laughs> the world wasn't an evil, horrible, awful place. I discovered that the world was a pretty amazing place. But again, that's what launched me into college. I had never planned on going to college. I wasn't going to go. I was a shipping clerk at a biological serum factory, and I thought that was cool. And it is. But I got to Indonesia, and I had five hours every day, pre-air conditioning days, where everything shut down from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And I could sleep the afternoon away, or I could study. And I spent two years, five hours a day, with the only books I had at my disposal, the Mormon scriptures. And I ended up spending three months to get through six pages, because I decided that I was going to cross-reference every concept I could find. It, I learned how to learn. And in learning how to learn, I learned also, I want to learn more. And I also want to see a little bit more of this world that's not what people told me it was who have never been there. And so I went to college. And I had the wonderful opportunity of having a college in my backyard, Utah State University. And my colleagues who taught me at Utah State University, Rick Cranick and Eddie Berry and Reed Gertzen, are here. Thanks. It was marvelous. And Eddie would always ask me, when a Mormon says, I would just say, don't worry about it, Eddie. <laughs> But I, I was Eddie's uh, Mormon barometer. Did it work, Eddie? She's still in Logan, so something happened. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to talk about the odds of something bad happening to you in a very kind of ratio type of way versus the unmitigated stupidity, my word, of 24-hour news channels. Read. <laughs> Don't watch the dumb news. There's about 7 billion people in the world, and there are 86,400 seconds of a day. If we take the old adage that you get your 15 seconds of fame, let's say something bad enough happens to you that you get 15 seconds of fame on a 24-hour news channel. Fox, MSNBC, choose your line of defense, I don't care. 84, uh, 86,400 divided by 15 seconds comes up to 5,760 people could have a chance at a 24-hour news channel to get onto the news. Okay. By this number, by the people in the world, 7 billion, okay, and times that by 100, you end up with a point zero 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 eight one seven percent chance of something bad enough happening to you to get onto the news. I'll take those odds even in Wendover, okay? All right, if that's the case, what we end up with with 24-hour news channels is compression of time and space. All you see is the nattering nabobs of negativity. You don't see everything else going on. If you want news, read news. Don't watch. I'll get to that in a minute. I'll take these odds any day. Okay? Knowledge. In the Mormon tradition, we say if you're prepared, you shall not fear. Okay? Get your own information. Get informed. Get a different perspective of things. Not the 24-hour news channels. My wife and I were in Jordan two Februarys ago, almost three now, when Mubarak fell in, in Egypt. And it was an interesting time to be in the Middle East. And we were watching the news channels. We were in the airport. And they're showing Trahir Square and people going supposedly crazy in Trahir Square. Well, how many people does Trahir Square hold? 6,000. How many Egyptians are there? A lot? 83 million. What were the other 83 million doing? Eating. <laughs> Reading. Praying. They weren't in Trahir Square. Where were the news cameras? Trahir Square. Okay. The anthropologist Harry Redner, in a book called Conserving Cultures, argues that when we use pictures, what we end up with is emotive responses. They're culturally universal. I can show you a picture of the killing fields in Cambodia, and every culture will have the exact same response. Pictures, visual effects, are emotive. They're emotional. He said, if you read, however, you have to use the language or languages as mediums. And you have to think and give meaning to what you're reading. It's not just emotion. You can elicit emotion through reading, but reading by necessity must also have an intellectual response. If you want news, read. Don't watch the 24-hour news channels. Like I said, I learned how to learn when I was in Indonesia. When somebody tells me, oh, you're thinking too much, oh, you shouldn't think, that's when my red flag goes up and I can summarily dismiss you. Sorry, but I'm going to think. Number nine, speak truth to power. Sometimes, it doesn't matter who you are, you're wrong. Okay? And sometimes somebody needs to tell you you're wrong. 
And sometimes when you're convinced because of your epistemic closure that you're not wrong, that's all the more time and opportunity to be told that you're wrong. Know what you believe and why and act accordingly, regardless who may see it differently, Epictetus. But don't be a jerk. You can actually have a conversation about, I don't think this is the way it should be without being a jerk. Notice the theme here. <laughs> the Battle of Gallipoli in World War I is a classic case in point of this, probably one of the most futile and worst cases of incompetency in modern warfare and groupthink. T.E. Lawrence and his men, 4,000 Arab irregulars as they were known as, could have landed on the shores of Alexandretta. 4,000 men, they could have cut off the Ottoman Empire and cut World War I in half, time-wise and casualty-wise. It was proposed to the British military command and they said, that's not the British way. So the British way was to attack Gallipoli, which was tall banks of cliffs that had Ottoman Turks with machine guns pointing down at the beach and wave after human futile wave of allied soldiers came marching out of the, uh, out of the trenches with no bullets in their guns and only bayonets. Eight months of this sheer stupidity, 252,000 allied casualties and they gained not one inch of rock. As the historian Scott Anderson in his book, Lawrence in Arabia, which came out this year as a marvelous book, said, most of these aspirants to the system, most of these were aspirants to the system, willing cogs in the vast, dumb, meat-grinding machinery that none dared acknowledge as such. Sometimes you gotta say, this is just dumb. And you gotta be willing to say it. And you gotta be willing, as in the prayer that, that Carol said for us today, you got to be willing to take the wrath sometimes when you do. A really great sociologist, Sigmund Bauman, in his book, Modernity and the Holocaust, he says, all throughout history we've argued, what's wrong with those Germans that they would have made the Holocaust? He said, it wasn't just the Germans. He said, it's this whole idea of efficiency anyway. I was just doing my job. He said, what's really interesting is why we haven't had more Holocausts. I was just doing my job. Sometimes you got to stop and say, no, I'm not going to do this. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, came up with the term bad faith. And he said, well, and he was writing during this time, during the occupancy of France in World War II. And he said, well, I didn't have any choice. And he said, if you say you have no choice, you commit an act of bad faith. Your choice might not be what you like. You might not like the choices that are placed before you, but you always have a choice. You can always say, no, I'm not going to gas Jews. You might take the gas yourself. It's still a choice. 10. Look for ways to affirm versus destroy without lowering the bar. I think this was an important one. It goes back to being nice. It goes back to speaking truth to power. It goes back to there are better ways to get things done than pounding people over the head and telling them they're idiots. It's the, cat, it's the classic, you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. I think we need to see the good in people first. Seeing the other is just way too easy. We can see it too fast, we can launch on it too fast, everybody's got a zit or a wart somewhere, and it's too easy to land onto and run with. In the Mormon tradition, we'll make an argument that there's anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report, praiseworthy. We seek after these things. Unfortunately, I don't think we do this very much. I think we love taking a crowbar and sticking it in and going, idiot. Here at BYU, CFS continuing faculty status or tenure, I think certain things should be stressful, but there's positive stress. If you're a new faculty member, you should love your job, and you should have a whole cast of supporting help saying, this is marvelous, we're so glad you're here, we want you to be here. It shouldn't relieve the stress that you've got to perform to be here, but the opposite of, we're going to try to figure out a way to get rid of you, that's not good. That shouldn't be a message that ever comes across to anybody in any context. If we hired you, we want you. We want to make you be successful. We want you to be stressed, but we want it to be positive stress. We want you to love your job and lose your hair while at the same time. <laughs> so finally, be a self-proclaimed ambassador to the world. It's a great place. The world's not evil. The world's not horrible. The world's not awful. There's seven billion people. You can't even get five people to agree to go where to dinner. 
all right? And yet we don't somehow blow each other up all the time. Let's change our perspective. The world's cool. So, Jared, can you roll that video? Never gets old, huh? Nope. It kind of makes you want to break into song. Yep. I love the mountains. I love the clear blue skies. I love big bridges. Bridge. I love when great whites fly. I love the whole world. And all its sights and sounds. Boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada. I love the ocean. I love real dirty things. I love to go fast. I love Egyptian kings. I love the whole world. And all its craziness. Boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada. I love tornadoes. I love arachnids. I love my magma. I love the giant squids. I love the whole world. It's such a brilliant place. Boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada. Far better message, in my opinion, than sitting back at the back of the room and talking about a world you've never been in and how awful it is. Number 11. Two more to go. Allow yourself to be taught by others with a different perspective. Be open to new truths. So I want to talk about some things that I've learned through my travels and interactions with that ubiquitous others. Okay? First off, don't commit the ecological fallacy. Don't stereotype. Don't get two keyboards and go at the same time. Met five people from New York, all five were jerks, therefore all New Yorkers are. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay? Give people a break. Learn who they are, and not just by the categories that they represent. It's a matter of size and ratios. There are 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. If 99.99% of them are marvelous, wonderful people, which I'm convinced they are, it still leaves over a million who are not. That's how big Islam is. How many Mormons are there in the world? 15 million. If you take the coop jobs, wing nuts, and wackos that Mormonism and its offshoot creates, we are a far, far scarier group by ratios <laughs> than the Muslims. Matter of context and perspective. Look at it simply as ratios and not as epistemic closure. We are a scary group. Okay? There are more Muslims in Indonesia. 20% of all Muslims in the world are Indonesians. All Muslims, uh, all Arabs combined represent 19%. When an American thinks of a Muslim, they think of an Arab with woolly hair, sitting with a bomb on his chest and a camel out in the middle of a desert, saying Allah Akbar. Why do we have that image? Read. Don't watch the damn news. Read. Okay? Why don't we think of a Jakarta businessman in a Bafik shirt walking into his office with a briefcase? That's cool. Or why don't we think of a person in Amman doing the same thing? That's cool. Get a different perspective. Arab hospitality is very real. <laughs> in the Bedouin tradition, you have to be at someone's house three and a quarter days before they can even ask you why you're there. It's awesome. <laughs> For six years traveling to Jordan, I like to brag that I have never once bought a meal. It's crazy. There's this wonderful dish called munsif, which is designed to put you to sleep. All right, it's rice with lamb. And one evening, I had three munsif dinners. Eat, eat, oh. I was literally rolling down the streets of Amman, okay? But Arab hospitality is incredibly real. Marvelous, wonderful people. This is my friend, Shlash Aoun. Um, he's now Abu Hassan because he had a son named Hassan. I just call him Slash Jordan. <laughs> but Slash is teaching me how to properly greet another Arab man in, in the Bedouin tradition. Great guy. Efficiency versus more humane relationships. I believe we live in what I'd like to call a microwave society. If something doesn't happen in 15 seconds, we're pissed off. We're mad. We sit at a stop stein and we wait for a little break in traffic and our feet go like this and our fingers are like this on the steering wheel. It's like, come on, come on. You see a three millimeter slot and you go for it. Mm, yeah, it's awesome. And you found out that the three millimeter slot was there because someone was texting in front of you. So slow down a bit sometimes. Take some things for granted. This is Anchor Watt. 
built in the 1200s. It's still there. <laughs> it took a while. It wasn't a microwave. It's one of my favorite, bargaining, a human versus an economic relationship. When I take students overseas, inevitably they come back and they're ticked off that that little dude was trying to rip them off in the marketplace. I hate it. I hate bargaining. They're just trying to rip me off. So I give them an assignment. I said, go out to the market, go to the Chiang Mai Night Bazaar, and watch Americans and come back appalled. They do. They come back appalled. It's like, you're trying to rip me off, you little monkey man. It's like, oh my gosh, I am not an American. I am not, yes, yeah, I have a tan, but not that good of one. But I am, no, I'm not that. It's awful. It's horrible. And I say, all right, first off, we have to understand something. I'm going to give you a metaphor. You guys help me out a lot, Rasha, Zaid. Tell me how accurate I'm on this. How often have you heard Muslims comment about America as being the great Satan? Have y'all heard that? All right. In Christianity, Satan is the embodiment of all evil. That's a Christian concept. That's a pr Christian context. Satan is the embodiment of all evil. That word is an Arabic word. It only comes into the English language post the Crusades. It exists three times in the King James Bible, which was translated into English in the 1600s. Okay? Shaitan. And it comes from, again, you guys correct me. Donnelly, correct me if I'm wrong, too. It comes from the basic root of, of dross, or refuge. And we started using it against the Muslims themselves during the Crusades. It also, by some etymological accounts and theories, it's not necessarily established, is the root for another interesting and very often used English word. Shirt minus an R. Figure it out. <laughs> okay? So, we look at that and we say, the great Satan, why do they think we're so evil? Satan, in the Islamic tradition, is the great trivializer. He's the guy that doesn't get it. He's not necessarily the embodiment of evil. He's the dude that always gets his priorities wrong. So there's a story told that Allah creates Adam and he commands all of creation to bow to Adam, including Iblis or Satan. And Satan says, no, I love Allah too much. I cannot bow to, to a creation, only to Allah. And he said, but I have commanded you to bow. And he refuses to and he is re rejected from heaven. The guy who just doesn't get it. It's not the great embodiment of evil necessarily. He's not saying he isn't evil in Islam either. It's just a different perception, a different concept, a different context. So, priorities. As Americans, we see things almost exclusively from an economic standpoint. That's how we've been trained. That's how we live our whole lives. Everything's an economic equation. Bargaining, though, is not an economic exercise. It is a human relationship. They are going to force you to treat them as a human being before they're going to allow you to get to the, dr the, the crass economic elements. So I tell the students to ask about their family. Say, hey, ask them about their family. See what happens. Whoops. It's somewhere on there. I did this relation. I did this PowerPoint, so I know it's there. Ask them about their family and come back tomorrow and tell me what happened. They come back, it was so much fun. It was great. I got the best deals. But they only got the best deals after they created a human relationship. One time I was in northern Sumatra and I was bargaining for some uh, sashes for Jerry Lynn. And I got into this great argument. It was so much fun. And this lady's going, if I give you your price, my children will starve. And she's laughing. I'm going, if I pay you that price, my children will starve. And we're just laughing. And we all know it's a joke. And we're just having a great time. And I finally said, nah, I just can't do it. And I, walk, I start walking out. And she sends her two kids. And they grab my legs. And they go, you can't go. And they're laughing. I ended up buying a whole bunch of sashes from them. Okay? <laughs> now, real quick, the last read of the day. This is from... Charles Dickens in his book, Hard Times. And one of the key figures in his book is a man by the name of Thomas Gradgrind, who's convinced that everything has to be completely rational and economic. Here's the quote. It was a fundamental principle of the Gradgrind philosophy that everything was to be paid for. Nobody was ever on any account to give anything to anybody or render anybody help without purchase. Gratitude was to be abolished and the virtues springing from it were not to be. Every inch of the existence of mankind from birth to death was to be a bargain across a counter. And if we didn't get to heaven that way, it was not a political, economical place, and we had no business there. Okay? We've got to get rid of the grad grind philosophy. Human versus economic relationships. My dad ran a store on Main Street in Logan, Utah. He had customers. 
Me and my brothers knew who my dad's customers were because customers have a human relationship with a merchant. Consumers have an economic relationship with Procter & Gamble. Walmart discovered this rather serendipitously. You walked into a Walmart and what's the first thing you see? A people greeter. Hello, hey, I feel warm and fuzzy. Okay, <laughs> it was rather serendipitous. In one of their Arkansas stores, they had an awful lot of, of uh, theft, shoplifting. They thought if we put a person up front and we say hello to every person who walks in, they'll know they're being watched. And sales will probably go down, but it'll be more than enough to compensate for what we're losing in shoplifting. Guess what happened to sales? Shot through the roof. So now, when you go to a Walmart and you hand them your credit card or your check, well, thank you, Mr. Brown. Hey, wow, they know my name. But if you're in the middle of the store and somebody comes up and says, can I help you, what do you do? No, back off. Just look at me. Okay? <laughs> when we walk in and when we check out, we want to be customers. When we're in the store, we want to be a consumer. Leave me alone. Okay? When something breaks, we want to be a customer. <laughs> help me. Okay? Otherwise, you know, we write our letter to Procter & Gamble and they say, try our other products. So customers versus consumers. You'll oftentimes see, when you go to the developing world, a whole row, a whole street of nothing but baskets, or a whole street of nothing but silverware, or, or pots and pans. And inevitably, every student that goes there goes, that's dumb. That's stupid. Why would they do that? Where's the competition in that? They all look exactly alike. Yeah, that's the whole point. Because you're not shopping for a pan. You're shopping for a relationship. You're shopping for the shopkeeper that you want to have a good relationship with. And if I need a pan, I'm not shopping for pans first. I'm shopping for a relationship. And then you go back to that person every time because you know them and they know you. And it's a great relationship. You don't earn love. It's already there. I used host families in Southeast Asia for our internships. Almost done here. And and there's an anthropologist by the name of Edward T. Hall, and he talks about high-context societies versus low-context societies, or group-based societies versus individualistic societies. Southeast Asians and Middle Eastern Arabs are all group-based. You don't earn love. When a host family accepts a BYU student into their house or a University of Utah student into their house, they already love you. It's a hard concept for a student to understand. Well, I haven't done anything yet. Well, good, don't. Okay. <laughs> If they've made the decision to make you part of their family, you're in, okay? In the United States, we have this phrase, eating together, families eat together, stay together. That's just an asinine comment over in a group-based society. It makes absolutely no sense at all. Modern ties rarely build a kitchen in their home. Food is so plentiful and cheap all around that nobody eats at home. And nobody in Thailand is questioning the stability of the family. It's a premise. You start with the premise that I am part of a group, and they have to come up with ways to re-emphasize that they can also be individuals. So they all are exactly alike in their individuality. They all go get Hello Kitty stuff from Korea. Okay? <laughs> we in the West have to remind ourselves that we're more than just individuals, that we also have to exist in group-based societies. We have to come up with things like families that eat together, stay together. It's contextualized. It's a different perspective. I take my students in Chiang Mai to the Buddhist university, and the rector of the university speaks to them about Buddhism. And he said, you Americans, you have monkey mind. He said, you're just like a monkey. You sit there and you go, OK, teach me. Oh, that's cool. Oh, look at that. Oh, I want that old. Is that brown? That's cool. And he said, you can't focus on anything. He said, it served you well as Americans, but it's also really hurt you. He said, you're very creative. You're very progressive. But you throw things away. You get through things too fast. You don't stop and look around and realize what you've missed in your hurry to do something new. So one last one on this. Another thing I've learned is organized chaos, the terror of trust in crossing the street in Vietnam. <laughs> Traffic in the developing world is a blast. I love it. They screwed up Phnom Penh this last year in Cambodia. They put railing down the middle of the major streets. No fun anymore. You used to have to diagonal across oncoming traffic because there's no such thing as a left-hand turn that's a 90-degree angle. And they put these darn rails in the middle of the streets now, and now you have to actually do left-hand turns at stoplights. It's just no more fun. What happens is you have to put your trust in people, not in arbitrary rules. There's no road rage in Southeast Asia. 
Nobody gets upset. I mean, they get upset, but they don't, there's no road rage. Several years back, about 20 years back, on interstate, on interstate, um, uh, what is it? I've forgotten now. I lived there, 25, not 25, interstate, uh, whatever it was, 70, in Columbia, Missouri, just outside, well, actually just outside of Raytown, Missouri, Kansas City. A man cut somebody else off in his car. The guy that got cut off chased him down. The guy was so perplexed that he was being chased down, he stopped, got out of his car, and the man pulled out a crossbow and shot him. Dead. Made the news. 24-hour news channel. Something bad enough happened to him. The odds ran out of his, in his favor. Okay? Shot him dead. You don't see that in Southeast Asia. It's like a school of fish or a flock of birds. You cue off from each other. And there are really are rules, but they're rules with each other. You have to be part of a group-based consciousness, and then it's fun. And if somebody violates the rules, there's ways to sanction them. You just, everybody squeezes a little tighter so they can't make their way through. <laughs> and everybody does it almost without any kind of nod. Everybody knows the rules, and you're violating the rules, so we just squeeze the little hoser off, and nobody can go by, okay? So Jared, would you show that? <clears throat> So I'm going to show you crossing the street in Vietnam. So we're going to watch this woman right here crossing the road. Whoops. <laughs> Something happened there. <laughs> this is right in front of the Central Market in Ho Chi Minh City. What you do is you walk out into traffic, it never stops, it goes around you, and you just have to be confident that they know the rules and you know the rules, and you try not to vary your pace, because they're trying to judge how not to hit you. <laughs> Big vehicles you let go by. All right, Jared, get ready. Right here. <laughs> so. So some random dude on a Segway went by, right, when I was filming that. It's like, he wins. All right, next slide. Number 12, joy in the interaction. The joy is in the relationship. Things are instrumental. People should not be. People are ends and not means to one. It's a big deal. We have whole things in universities called human resources. That sounds nice from a business economic perspective. It sounds pretty despicable from another perspective. Human beings are ends, not means to an end. Things bring people together. The joy is in the thing that brings us together. Jared, would you roll this last video? So this is my Khmer Bongo Jam. Khmer Bongo Jam. <laughs> It's hot, by the way. I sweat when I watch Eskimo movies, so. <laughs> Impromptu, by the way. We didn't practice this. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I ended up buying this one from him. <laughs> he was happy. Next. All right. Finally, 13, the last point I want to make. Life is in the journey and not in the arrival. Live for the journey. Live for the opportunities to cross frontiers. Live for the opportunities to be challenged. None of us like to go out and look for character building experiences. It kind of sucks sometimes. But we should. Okay? Appreciate what you have, but also realize what you don't have. Bring it home with you. I tell the students who go on these activities, on these internships, be there long enough to realize what you have as an American if you're an American and appreciate it. But then be there long enough to realize what you don't have and bring it home with you. Cross a frontier. Do something different. Challenge your epistemic closure. Change your context. Change your perspective. Get a new idea of what's going on. And never stop searching for the truth. Damn it. Okay? <laughs> and finally, also in the Mormon tradition, we argue there's only a couple of things you can take with you when you go. We argue that that same sociality which exists with you here will go with you. And knowledge. Those are two things you get to take. 
the relationships you have with people, and what you learned. I'm blessed with both these things. I'm blessed with wonderful relationships with you guys. You honor me by being here. You humble me by being here. And I love the idea of the search for truth. And I don't care where I'm getting it. When I was on my mission in Indonesia, I was asking them to read my book, so I thought I ought to read theirs. And I read an interpretation of the Quran. I read it in English. And I thought, this is a marvelous book. And it has marvelous truths in it to teach people. And it does amazing things. And I've tried to read Hinduism and Buddhism and every kind of ism out there. It's great. Cross a frontier. Get a different perspective. Get a new idea. Open up your epistemic closure. And finally then, the truths that we're looking for are to be found in our oh-so-human relationships with each other. They're not somewhere enigmatically placed off into some ether. And if you just search hard enough, you're going to find them at the peril of interacting with other people. It's the interactions with people and people who are different from you that's going to get you to those truths. And they're going to be constantly challenged every day. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. I think you understand why Ralph gets excellent teaching evaluations. I think you, uh, <laughs> uh, we will have a few comments by Dean Ben Ogles, um, and then I'll let you each guess uh, how many books Ralph has in his library. But <laughs> Dean Vino, Ben Ogles. Thanks, Ralph. That was wonderful. Look forward to the uh, rest of the series. If I could have Macy Baker, Bronwyn Dromi, and Zaid Attar, am I saying that right? If you could come up to the front of the room, please, the three of you. If you just join me right up here. No <laughs> yeah, no yeah. And also, if I could have uh, Boyd, if you'd join us, and Ralph, if you'd join us here. Please, just for a second. I'm, a, I'm pleased to announce that um, these three have been identified as the first recipients of the Brown Family Endowment. That uh, we were so endowed. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll each receive a thousand dollars scholarship uh, from the Brown Family, and. Uh, we want to acknowledge that, uh, let, me tell, let me tell you a little bit more about this. The Brown family called and wanted to give the initial support, the first support for this endowment. And, and in that three weeks, we've since then, uh, in part because of the generous major gifts that were given afterwards, in, in particular from Todd and Mary Gay Sibley, we've raised $61,885 in the last three weeks. Pretty exciting. I think uh, that and this crowd here uh, expresses some of the love that we all feel for Ralph and how great it's been to have him here as a faculty member at Brigham Young University. Our goal is 100,000, and um, I love the word endowment because of its Mormon connections as well, <laughs> right? It's a gift. I think it's the Las Vegas connection, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a gift, right? And it's a gift that's always increasing and always continues to give. And I think that's fitting to, as a tribute to the Brown family. So thank you very much. One more round of applause for these three.